Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. There are several deserving candidates for a spot on the Mount Rushmore of Photonics News buzzwords in 2022. Think Metasurface, Semiconductor, Metalens, Vexel, or Quantum. Surely there are more candidates than there are spots on this hypothetical mountain, but no Photonics News Mount Rushmore is complete in 2022 without the inclusion of LiDAR. Today on All Things Photonics, that's where we head. While looking at the top LiDAR news of 2022 guides us into explorations of the latest trends in autonomous mobility and ADAS, LiDAR itself is hardly a novel technology, and it's hardly limited in its use cases. Amid recent news of Velodyne and Auster announcing plans to combine, and Luminar LiDAR units entering series production, the technology in its other forms is widely deployed above, on, and below Earth. In our first segment, we set out to Texas for a conversation with Joey Thomas and Saul Nucitelli, both from the Texas Water Development Board. Thomas, a Geographic Information Systems Program Specialist, is using what is known as topobathymetric LIDAR along Texas's Llano River to collect data that will help to prevent flooding. That data, as Nucitelli, the Texas Water Development Board's Director of Flood Science and Community Assistance, explains, is critical to helping residents understand and plan for flood risk. And later, in our second segment, we head further south to the Mexican state of Campeche, where LiDAR is again being deployed, this time to investigate the ancient Mayan city of Calakmul. Here, the scanning technique relies on three wavelengths to peer beneath the forest canopy. The LiDAR data obtained from this ancient city reveals information on how Calakmul residents accessed and used water, information that in turn enables archaeologists to gain additional understanding about the settlement and its residents. Up next, we turn it over to Jake Saltzman with Saul Nucitelli and Joey Thomas from the Texas Water Development Board. Our agency was formed initially to look after water supply planning for the state. You know, Texas is a state that has lots of challenges and uh, having available water for all its citizens has been a priority. Over time, we evolved to also include understanding flood risk as part of our mission. So now we're, we're kind of evolved into pretty much all things water. And uh, with kind of the, the recent hurricanes and disasters that we've had, it's become an even greater priority for our agency. Specifically with regards to the kind of the flood space, Hurricane Harvey was a kind of a landmark event. Uh, in 2017, Harvey hit primarily Texas, a little bit Louisiana, over $100 billion in, in flood damage, over 100 deaths, hundreds of thousands of homes flooded, you know, just record-setting event. And, and that, what that caused is uh, the state legislature in 2019 to kind of greatly enhance our agency's capability in addressing flood risk. State said, you know what, we need to be a lot more involved with this. We can't just leave it for the local communities and for the federal government to figure out. And so that really changed how we, uh, as a state agency, looked after flooding. And and it changed in three primary ways. First was in how we identify and uh, describe flood risk for folks. So kind of an initial focus on flood hazard mapping. The second thing is to improve and really develop in kind of a new framework how we think about regional and statewide flood planning. In other words, you know, how are we going to manage future floods? How are we going to responsibly develop in areas? How, how could we mitigate for flood risk? And then finally, thirdly, provide state funding to help local and regional communities and, and uh, government agencies to specifically mitigate for flooding. So basically mapping, planning, and mitigation. Those are kind of the three core tenants that evolved for us with with flooding and in response to Harvey and other other disasters that have occurred. So no doubt there are legislative 
I'll go so far as to say political challenges that any agency must deal with. Um, another one, and this is another sort of place setting type question, is the fact that you're doing this in Texas, which in addition to being an incredibly large state is also an incredibly diverse one, just in terms of the climate um, that is found in the state. Can you talk about the challenges of doing the work that you do in that environment? Texas has a lot of different ecoregions. So we have desert, we have coastal plains, we have Texas Hill Country, Piney Woods, so all kinds of different types of terrain, different kinds of slopes, you know, we have real mountainous areas to real flat areas. And then we're, we have really tightly urban areas with, you know, lots of high rises and lots of densely packed areas. And then uh, lots of just broad open rural areas and agriculture and, and open land use and, and identifying kind of the needs in all those different kinds of areas can be very challenging. We turn next to Joey Thomas for a description of the LiDAR technology in use along the Llano River. The Llano extends for more than 100 miles and presents a range of challenges for those taxed with scanning it. The Texas Water Development Board and the Texas Natural Resource Information System, or TNRIS underneath it, is well versed in obtaining LiDAR scans, though, as Thomas mentioned, new to topobathymetric LiDAR. By definition, this method simultaneously measures and records information about land, water, and submerged land, whether buried in soil or water, together via airborne laser-based sensors. The Llano, as Thomas explained, proved a logical setting to trial the method. The river is a popular recreational destination, and the LiDAR data allows Thomas and his colleagues to see just what the bottom of the river looks like, as well as a picture of the riverbanks and surrounding areas. From a LIDAR aspect and as an elevation specialist, it was a huge endeavor for us because it was our first endeavor um, acquiring topobathymetric LIDAR data in Texas. And so that uses a little bit different uh, wavelength of laser. I believe it's a 532 nanometer um, wavelength. And this was the first river that we were actually able to try to get good results on. Uh, And we have started getting some of that back and it is uh, looking pretty good. So maybe walk us back. Tell us about the project on which you're currently deployed. Specifically on the South Llano? Correct. Yes. Okay. So, so we were approached by our surface water folks and they were inquiring into this technology. And we were, of course, have been very interested in it as it will help us support the state of Texas acquiring bathymetric data And so it was selected predominantly because of how clear and, you know, it's not turbid water. It's, uh, from my understanding, it's mostly spring fed. It's difficult to go out and survey all those areas, um, especially long stretches of it take a tremendous amount of time and resources for the state. And so uh, we finally gotten to a point and the technology, I believe, has gotten to a point where we were actually able to go out and collect a lot of the stream morphology um, and the hydrology and be able to examine and model certain aspects of that using the topo LIDAR. Our laser-centric audience is no doubt familiar with LIDAR and how the technique works. Topographic LIDAR is a variant I don't think that we've certainly covered um, at any great length, pun intended there on the length. <laughs> Tell us about how the te- that, that particular version, I suppose, of LIDAR is, is used. So for the topographic LIDAR, I mean, that's that's kind of uh, one of the bread and butter data sets for the state. Its application spreads across a huge multitude of uh, disciplines. Um, predominantly, it's just using a near-infrared spectrum um, laser, and it's just measuring these elevations um, in an airborne system from the air to the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, for, for the most part, the ability of us to get that data and have these huge point clouds, which we can then additionally classify. It allows us to strip out things we're not interested in and just focus on certain aspects of the Earth's surface. So if we just want to look at canopy heights, we can do that with the LIDAR. If we want to create building footprints, we can do that with the LIDAR. Um, Basically, if you want to examine anything that a laser beam will reflect off of, um, you can do it with LIDAR data. I'll comment in real quick about how we're using it for flood modeling and mapping. The uh, the LIDAR, the point cloud data, like, like Joey was describing, you know, we can take out or strip out some of the data that we don't want in our modeling. And so we, we end up, for our flood modeling, use, utilizing what we call bare earth topography. So kind of without the trees, without the buildings, without the bridges, but just kind of the bottom terrain. And then the, the type of flood modeling we do 
kind of refer to it as, as rain on grid. So if you, th- you think of those plastic scale models, you maybe saw as a kid with kind of plastic terrain and fake trees and monopoly houses, whatever, and you tip a watering can and you kind of rain on the ground and things wash away. That's, that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing the same thing, but in a computer virtual environment to, to do our flood modeling work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think flood modeling is worth defining for our audience too, um, because flood planning is not flood modeling, is not flood monitoring. Um, I've made that mistake of, of conflating those terms several times. When we talk about flood modeling, what exactly are we talking about? Certainly. Uh, so, so flood modeling is just trying to understand uh, in either two ways. What is the risk of a specific event how much flooding might occur. So, you know, Hurricane Ian was the recent event in Florida and, you know, there was, there were flood models that the National Weather Service was doing and trying to understand exactly to what extent water would be covering the ground. So there's flood modeling for specific events uh, that primarily the Weather Service and and federal agencies focus on. And then there's flood modeling for kind of a, a recurrence interval event. What is the chance of a certain kind of flood to occur? So a lot of people have heard the term 100-year flood. Well, that's a, a 1% annual chance event, a 1 over 100 chance occurring. And then we can you know, develop other recurrence frequencies, a 10% chance flood or a 10-year flood. These different recurrence interval floods give communities and the general public a, a sense of what their flood risk is in a given area. And so these flood models take what are the chances of rainfall falling from the sky how much will infiltrate into the ground versus how much is going to run off. And then of the amount that runs off, where does it go and how deep does the water get in certain areas? Right. I think we all generally know it flows to the creeks and the rivers, but how much does 10 inches of rain on a given watershed, how deep does that make a given Creek and how wide will that floodplain get? What we're trying to do is understand statistically, what are these chances of occurring and in order to estimate a, let's say, a 1% annual chance, you need to have hundreds of years of data records to be able to predict it, right? So, you know, what's the chance of pulling a black marble out of, you know, 199 red marbles? Well, if you don't understand kind of the underlying science of, of how rain can fall from the sky and then how much can get absorbed into the ground, you, you know, you're coming up with very coarse risks. And then if, if the statistics are moving, in the sense that if there is sea level rise or if there is the chance for increased precipitation over time, then the statistics aren't just a static estimate of pulling the one black marble, right? So then there's chances of it occurring more frequently. So when people toss out 100-year rain or 100-year flood, the the estimates that we made before uh, may change over time. And so that that certainly makes it a a much more challenging effort to to try to keep up with that. Yeah. And I'll also add that... um, you know, as, as those changes happen, a lot of uh, that modeling and stuff is based on that LIDAR data. So having current high quality LIDAR data is definitely integral to a lot of those processes. Um, and as we see like these areas developing, especially in urban areas and the amount of impervious cover increasing and the, you know, deforesting certain areas in that aspect, like having that LIDAR data is integral to support that mapping. Call it LIDAR data. It, that's what it is. There are multiple different ways to obtain a scan um, in the point cloud and, and even to interpret a, port, a point cloud. What are some of the benefits of a LIDAR-based scan, an aerial LIDAR-based scan, as opposed to some of the other methods that could be deployed for, for this kind of pursuit? Uh, well, I think in the past it was, I mean, Saul, you might, you probably can comment on this, but it was just based on like a bunch of survey, like physical survey that would be done, correct? Yeah, um, there was, uh, and still is, I guess, to an extent, photogrammetric uh, topography that's used. Uh, so that's another way of estimating the topography on the ground using uh, aerial imagery, but then also u- utilizing ground survey. So literally surveyors on the ground with, uh, you know, ground surveying equipment. And, and what we would do in the past would be to, rather than survey a broad swath of terrain, uh, they would cut cross sections. So in other words, survey a line, right? A cross section is just a line and uh, cut across the creek. And then that line would represent, uh, be an estimate for a given stretch of creek. Well, 
you know, as you all know, the, you know, topography changes quite frequently. So with both advances and being able to, to utilize something like a LIDAR point cloud, but then advances in computing power, right? So, you know, without, without the computers yeah. being able to process things with all this high density data, and then also advances in our software, both on the LIDAR side and the flood modeling side, uh, you then get, you know, better ability to draw those computations, put all those computations together to come up with some results. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll say that, you know, our ability to actually map much larger areas is enabled by the LIDAR. And especially as we've seen the trend of the topographic LIDAR with the vertical accuracies continually coming down and staying in the sub 10 centimeter range um, has been huge for the quality when you're obtaining data, I think a, a, a good gauge for the effectiveness of the data, the quality of the data even, is how accessible it is, how meaningful it is to the public. Uh, this is fairly complex data. Not anyone can look yeah. at it and understand exactly what is being obtained. Walk us through the process of getting the data not only in the hands of the population, citizens, but also of then explaining it to make sure that the, you know, this becomes actionable information. The large majority of state agencies that are dealing with geospatial data, they are aware of LIDAR and they are using it. And we, especially when we form the specifications for acquiring the LIDAR, we try to ensure that it will be as applicable as possible to everybody. You know, we classify different stages of vegetation, um, low, medium, and high. We have buildings, we identify culverts, we classify these different aspects of the LIDAR so that when it is presented to the public or other state agencies, it can have an application and they don't have to do additional work to get it to work. Um, and so we deliver this data to the public and to other agencies through our website. Um, so all this data is widely available. It's easily accessible and download. Uh, we've also developed a bulk downloader for our website because, you know, you'll have collections that are, you know, 10,000 square miles. And so instead of having to click on hundreds of tiles, you can just go in and download an entire collection. Now they are huge data sets. Um, and so we were able to do a compression on them using an LAC uh, compression, and that allows us to distribute them um, to the public and make them as accessible as possible. Extreme weather events this fall, including unprecedented flooding in Pakistan and Hurricane Ian in Florida, beg the question, what's next? In essence, how can we be sure that technology will keep up with increasingly devastating weather events, many of which involve water? Some assurances are found in a look at how far the technology has come. What we're able to do now is very different than what we're able to do 10 years ago. So, one of the latest advancements at the federal level is uh, something called the National Water Model. And uh, it's able to, you know, in real time, uh, estimate for pretty much every stream reach in the continental United States, kind of an ongoing estimate of flood risk. And that's not something that was around 10 years ago. So our ability to process high density data but then also understand the meteorology and the, the, the weather risks, all those things mean we have better ability to predict and estimate these risks. It, there's, of course, the other side of the coin, which is where we choose to build and develop and whether we're putting ourselves in harm's way. And so that's where understanding flood risk comes from. So not just predicting a specific flood, but a general understanding of flood risk so that communities, whether it's in the U.S. or anywhere around the world, can better understand the risk in a given area. And so maybe it'd be less likely that they would either develop or redevelop in a given area after a disaster. Strictly speaking, uh, uh, sort of call it on the ground technology, although as, as we've gone over, this is really sort of in the air technology. What, what's forthcoming? Are, are there any technological trends that we might be seeing in terms of monitoring or, or, or mapping? For our program, things that we're kind of moving into is we're definitely looking into trying to acquire more bathymetry data uh, for the state. I know that there's been some discussion on some, uh, I guess, terrestrial LIDAR and mapping of like roads and that sort of thing. Uh, but I mean, nothing 
nothing concrete yet, but there is a lot of interest and there is a lot of, you know, desire for these types of data sets. Mm-hmm. Are, are you or your, is the agency working with, with other agencies, other state agencies or interstate agencies to yeah, implement this technology? Yeah. So we, you know, for a long time, the StratMap program itself was unfunded and our job was basically just to manage these LIDAR data acquisitions on behalf of state entities. Um, a lot of cities have partnered with us. A lot of the counties, the river authorities, um, you know, Parks and Wildlife consistently partners with us for acquiring data for their parks and the development of those parks. Um, it, it's The GLO is consistently using the data for their purposes as well. It, it has become a kind of widespread used geospatial data for state agencies in Texas. As the old saying goes, it takes a village to perform a detailed LIDAR-based exploration of a long-buried ancient settlement. And so, in our next segment, we've compiled a panel to help us get there. From bases in three different countries, the Intracontinental team is using LIDAR to survey the ancient Mayan city of Calic Mule. Survey data will be provided to the government of Mexico to aid in the development of policy and planning for the biosphere. An increase in regional tourism is forecasted in and around the states of Campeche and Yucatan, and comprehension of the area and its physical history supports efforts to accommodate more people more often. Our interview is next. Catherine Reese Taylor is a professor in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Calgary. Uh, Felix Kuprat is an archaeologist and anthropologist with UNAM, the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. And Juan Carlos Fernandez Diaz, civil and environmental engineering at the University of Houston. They're here to speak about a, uh, a pursuit that they're all engaged on with additional collaborators and colleagues. It's a most interesting pursuit to explore beneath the forest canopy of the Calic Mule biosphere in southeastern Mexico. Now, Calic Mule is a um, vast and fairly well investigated Maya city at this point in the southeastern state of Campache. Now, this group is deploying LIDAR imagery for its investigation, and they've carved out time. Um, in advance of a LIDAR workshop, fittingly enough, to chat with us today. Um, we've put the struggles of time zone and time change behind us, uh, I hope. Um, now, Catherine, <laughs> um, thank you again all for being here. Uh, before we get into the technological facets of this work, um, I'm very curious to receive some context on Calic Mool. This latest round of investigation has received considerable attention. Uh, I suppose my question for you, Catherine, is why Calic Mool and, and why now? Well, in our recent conversations, you know, I explained that we had been working in this region for over 10 years. So we've been working in an area that centers around a large wetland area. And because of these wetlands, it experienced a large population growth, especially early in Maya culture history. And so we've explored areas south of Kalakmul and have a fairly good understanding of the um, initial colonization of the region and the early development of cities in the area. But recently, we wanted to turn our attention to what was sort of the center of gravity for this region, which is Kalakmul at the height of Maya culture history uh, during the late classic period, where you have the largest populations there. And we're particularly interested in um, how urbanization took form in the region and how this urbanization Um, affected the environment and how the Maya used traditional land use practices to to create sustainable urbanism. They were in this region for, I think, urban development has a a almost 2,000-year culture history in this area. And uh, we have a very sort of protracted view of sustainability in our own culture. And we're, we're wanting to look at long-term sustainability, how people develop resilience and, and can change their practices in order to accommodate large populations. And there's really no better place to look at this than Kalakmul, because we already had a very good idea that there were dense populations there, not only from some previous work that's been done, particularly a mapping project by William Follin and his colleagues in the 1980s, but also by our work in the southern part of the of the wetlands area. And so we knew that this was an ideal opportunity to explore some of these questions. 
So one one of the fascinating thing about this reason, region is that we know that it was heavily populated about 1,000, 1,500 years ago. And um, we really still don't understand how and why, because it's a it's an area where there are no permanent lakes, no rivers. So water is always uh, a concern for those people. And um, we now see this huge, huge labor invested in creating reservoirs, large scale reservoirs, uh, very complex hydraulic systems to just collect rainwater and um, direct seasonal streams into those reservoirs, filter the water, all that uh, technology that was developed over a thousand years ago, at, at in some places 2000 or even 3000 years ago. So we see how people really, really got creative and developed those very interesting technologies that we know very little about today. <laughs> and um, water is today a concern more than ever, right? And in that region, uh, it is still a problem for the people who who, who live there. Um, so maybe we can even learn something from the ancient Maya about our modern water management and urbanization and how we should build sustainable settlements in, in, in those areas. You know, LIDAR, light detection and, and ranging is not by any means a novel technology at this point. I mean, uses in agriculture and archaeology and mobility and any kind of survey, really. But it's a very powerful tool and it's a tool of interest. And that means it's continuously being innovated and there are improvements being made to the mechanism. And its uses are continually being improved by both practitioners and technicians. Uh, Juan, I have a two-part question here for you. How is LIDAR being used in Calakmul? Walk us through a deployment and what has to happen for it to be a successful deployment. And the second part of that is beyond Calakmul, what qualities of the method put it into favor for, for archaeological work? Can I answer uh, the questions in reverse order? Yeah, I've given you, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the thing with LiDAR as compared to any other kind of remote sensing is that we are able to actually use LiDAR to see underneath vegetation canopies. And that's the, that's the big thing. I mean, like for, for decades, archaeologists have been trying to use like remote sensing techniques, aerial photography, radar, and, and so many different techniques to try to pierce through the vegetation canopies and see what's what's hidden underneath these, uh, these uh, jungles and forests and stuff. So that's the, that's the big advantage. From an airborne platform, uh, usually like a manned aircraft, we're able to do hundreds, if not uh, millions of measurements per second uh, on, the, on the topography. And uh, a fraction of those uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of measurements are able to go all the way from the airplane across the, the, all the tree canopy, all the way to the ground and come back through holes in the canopy back to the airplane, right? And, um, and that's, a, that's the main advantage. So we're able to create a bird's eye view of the topography of the terrain. And, and the terrain also includes like, you know, man-made structures like pyramids, like, you know, uh, little houses, like uh, irrigation canals, defensive features and a lot of a lot of, of different kinds of, of, of features. So that's a, that's the advantage. To do something like this, I mean, um, we we I always say like you know we want like you know four things to happen at the same time. <laughs> four things have to come together. We have to have obviously like you know equipment uh, mounted on an airplane that will be functioning <laughs> at the same time that we have a crew. That it's usually like a pilot and an operator, a LiDAR operator in a plane, uh, plus a bunch of people on the ground, like manning, like GPS stations. And we need the weather to, to be good. And we need like, you know, like the, the, the conditions to, to be good. So a lot of things need to happen in order to make a, a LiDAR su su uh, survey successful. But, you know, it requires a, a LiDAR equipment that it's mounted on, a, on an airplane. The kind of LiDAR equipment that we have, it's, uh, it's quite big. It uh, weighs probably about 300 pounds altogether. So it requires like a medium-sized uh, twin-engine aircraft. Although, like, of course, people know, like, people have been doing, like, also LiDAR from drones with, like, smaller, less capable units, right? So 
So that, that's what it takes. And it takes a lot of uh, coordination, planning, uh, logistics, moving people back and forth, setting again uh, GPS or GNSS stations on the ground to triangulate the position of the aircraft and the sensor, um, getting permits. Uh, and, the, and the most important thing, like everything, it's money. The people like Catherine and, and Felix have to find uh, the money to make all of this uh, possible. No money, no LiDAR images. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fair enough. You know, LiDAR has so much value in imaging and in, in data collection for archaeology, really in all manner of survey, as I said. There are obstacles to its adoption, not the least of which uh, is cost. Um, but the ability to process data is a critical piece to a successful use case, maybe not a deployment, but but the whole value of a, of a use case. Algorithms are constantly evolving, um, and that puts comprehension of those algorithms at a premium. In terms of the format of the data that this work is obtaining, and I, I think, Juan, this is another question for you, what's ultimately output? So you have a deployment, what do you have at the end of that? There's a, there's the data products are, are are many and diverse, right? But I will like you know just focus on the ones that we get to Kathy and Felix and many other archaeologists. So I mean, after I usually say that for every hour that we play, spend on the plane, we can spend between four to ten hours processing the data and producing like you know stuff that it's useful for archaeologists. And it, this comes in in basically two varieties. Uh, the first thing it's a point cloud that uh, as the name implies, it's just like a cloud of points that have like 3D coordinates, X, Y, Z. And, and of course, these have been classified depending on the, of the nature of the object that produced like uh, the reflection. It could be vegetation, it could be ground, it could be modern structures. So it's been classified and cleaned and like, you know, processed neatly. And then like uh, what's, um, what's and, and this is the, I think the main lighter product then we can derive some uh, subsequent LiDAR products that are the ones that are most useful perhaps to, to at least prospective archaeology. Uh, and it, that's when we go and try to find things uh, under the vegetation, right? And what we do is that basically we remove all the LiDAR returns that come from the vegetation and only leave the returns that are coming from the ground and potential structures that are on the ground. And we create like a, 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 a two and a half D raster model. So it has like a, an X, a Y, and a C. Uh, and this is a, like what we call the digital elevation model. And uh, based on those digital elevation models, then uh, Felix and uh, Kathy go to town and like, you know, apply like a different kinds of visualization algorithms and produce like different kinds of images that then they analyze, digitize, and, you know, obsess and lose sleep over. The team's forthcoming effort in Colic Mule is hardly its first such endeavor. Similar to how our guests from the Texas Water Development Board spoke of critical advancements in technology, Reese Taylor notes some of the progress that has helped her and her colleagues in the last few years. In application, the effectiveness of the LiDAR mechanism is unparalleled, helping to allow experts like Reese Taylor, Kuprat, and others to work with crystal clear images and make accurate reads. With sometimes subtle differences between cultural and vegetative features, the accuracy of the LiDAR itself is crucial. In the area south of Kalakmul, we actually went out and did a study where we we did a random sampling of different blocks, and we did pedestrian survey of those blocks. We had our LIDAR images at that point, which was 2015. We had them in our um, Garmin units. Now we have them in our telephones, so it's really <laughs> much and yes. in color. So we've, we've progressed um, in terms of our field, our field equipment that we use. Um, but you go along and you, you are following your LIDAR on your, with your GPS on your telephone or your, on your, or your GPS device. And you come across a feature and then you look and you see, is this feature man made or is it a, is it a cultural feature? We found that in the area where we were working, the LIDAR was, it's um, 97% accurate in identifying cultural features, but in some areas of particular types of vegetation, there are issues with 
some vegetation communities or huge fallen trees looking like small house structures or field walls. And so you have to be very careful and do the ground verification in order to know the accuracy of your LIDAR. Surprisingly, the forest around Kalakmul is different from the forest south of the Bajo. So we will have to do a similar study there to look at the accuracy of the LIDAR in that area. Over the course of your time, your times in the field, what have been some of the most noticeable improvements or advancements to the imaging technology? Because we're, we're a lot better off now than we were even five years ago. When you compare the 2014 collection with the 2022 collection, it's it's an incredible difference. The sensor, um, uh, the new sensors that uh, Lot One and others are using for the 2022 collection are um, much higher. Use um, three wavelengths, not just one, and so as a result, we get much more information per scan, and the accuracy and the precision is much much higher. Um, So I see that as a huge advancement. Also, little things like the ability to get the images with much, much more. So when we put them in to our GPSs in 2014, there was a bit of stretching and a bit of, you know, finagling that we had to do to get them to work in the GPS. But in the phones, the, the phone technology has just incredibly advanced. And so our ability to get the images into the field, into the hands of researchers out there every day walking in the field has become easy. It's become really great. And so I think that's a big advancement as well. Yeah, You've seen definitely. lots of changes too. Yeah. So um, now we are applying those, those images of topography with about like four pixels per square meter. And we can load files of 100 square kilometers onto the phone without really any, any trouble of performance. It doesn't even have to be a high-end device. Yeah. It's incredible. It's, working. <laughs> it's yeah. incredible because you look back at papers where the numbers are just, you know, <laughs> far less or far less impressive yeah. than they are now. Uh, you know, the, the factor to which this technology has increased is and increased quickly is is impressive. Um, Felix, I didn't need to cut you off. Um, sorry about that. No, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and we 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 add to that um, by just on the same device you can take notes, you can take additional photos, and then we um, we also employ other technologies to register mm-hmm. what we what we ground truth. So um, sometimes it's possible to fly uh, drones with smaller camera, just cameras, and do photogrammetry on some of the features, and um, combine that within this much broader spatial framework that the LiDAR data provides. Um, so we can get, have d- different different resolutions and different media um, just combined in one, one big database, which is great. Uh, I, I do also want to get into just the, the, you mentioned the three wavelength LiDAR, the, the Titan system. I know is one that this group is is quite familiar with. Um, airborne laser scanning is really a technique that can be quite flexible. It can be very well tailored, well adapted to the project uh, on which you're working. And those who are familiar with LIDAR and using it know that. Not everybody does, but I think well-versed practitioners do. Uh, the Titan multi-wave LIDAR for, for earboard mapping emits at, uh, I guess it would be 1550, 1064, and also 532. Catherine and Felix Juan, I suppose, what makes that so useful in this particular type of a use case? Well, I think like there's different uh, there are different things beyond just the the, the wavelength. Uh, the the other thing that it's important to keep in mind is that um, these three wavelengths are looking at the ground at three different slight angles. So the the 1064 looks straight down, and then like you have the 1515 looking about 3.5 degrees ahead, and then the the 532 nanometers looking seven degrees ahead of nor of uh, of nadir. So basically what you're doing is like you're maximizing the, well, not maximizing, but you're creating more possible paths for the LiDAR, the laser energy to go from the sensor to, through the canopy to the ground and back. So that, that's that's one advantage, right? I mean, like uh, there's another example and um, basically we're making 
the LiDAR data richer. There's there's more more features there, right? Uh, not this particular case, but like we had a, another project in Belize. Uh, when we use the VEM or the digital elevation model, the area was flat. There's nothing there. But then using the intensity of the backscatter signal, the, the intensity of the LiDAR, LiDAR intensity, we can create like a, a false color 3D uh, or a false color map of that area. And to our surprise, actually, that area that was flat, the intensity image showed like, you know, canals in uh, agricultural canals. Uh, basically, the canals have been filled, but uh, and now it's flat, but it, the canals still carry water. And then that changes the vegetation and the soil moisture and stuff like that. And through the intensity features, we're able to see it. Another critical thing to actually see more, it's actually, there's several things that have happened uh, in the development of, uh, of lasers that allow, you know, an improvement from five years ago to now. One, one is the fact that we can do uh, laser pulses that are narrower and, and narrower actually means that you can be more precise about the ranging. You can also detect m more returns. So you want pulses that are narrow, but that it, that have, well, narrow, that they, they can be also repeated very fast. And 10, 20 years ago, we were talking about a pulse repetitions frequencies about three kilohertz. And nowadays, it's like you, I mean, it's not uncommon to hear a three megahertz pulse uh, laser, right? But what you want also, it's like the, the pulse is to be narrower, to pack as much energy as possible, and to pulse as, as fast as possible. So like, you know, like um, archaeology see the, the, the ability that we can create like higher density maps today, right? But this is possible because engineers have been able to create these kind of, of lasers that have these characteristics, right? Like now our pulses, good energy uh, per pulse and like, you know, pulse as, you know, as fast as possible. There's another, there are many considerations. They all branch out into many different important directions. And I, I don't mean to sound like an expert on any of them here, but I, I suppose the ethics, I guess, of archaeology would be a consideration too. And this investigation, like all investigations, coincides with current day life. Uh, that doesn't, time doesn't literally stand still. And even though we're talking about work in Kampache, the bordering Yucatan state is very much a population zone ripe with, with much more than beneath ground settlements. How does an investigation like this intersect with life and societal initiatives and government in 2022? Because obviously there's, there's a connection there. We work in a biosphere. So I want to make that, first of all, very clear. We are not putting LIDAR over people's communities and homes and, and exposing people's private property to our LIDAR analysis. So we work in a protected area, which I think allows us somewhat more um, flexibility in order to um, get permission to do LIDAR. We get permission through the government of Mexico, particularly through the national agency, the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, INA. Um, they are the ones that gave us permission to do the LIDAR survey. And in our particular agreement with INA, which um, it, the LIDAR is a part of their cultural patrimony. And so we do not own the LIDAR. It is literally copyrighted by the Mexican government. Um, and so we are not the ones actually that will wind up managing and storing and using the LIDAR in perpetuity. It belongs to the people of Mexico. Because of that, we work closely to try and look at issues of best, best practice and who actually can eventually get LIDAR snippets or information about LIDAR. And we are very committed to working with INA to develop policies that allow LIDAR to be more useful and used in common practices. Like, I don't have the authority to do this, but I recently had somebody who's publishing a textbook who wanted to use one of the LIDAR pictures. And I can't say, yes, you can do that because it's not mine. I have to check with Ina. But those are the kinds of things that we want to be able to 
this is a great technology and it's a really useful information and we want it to be freely available for those kinds of purposes, particularly educational purposes. Um, we also think that researchers who work in the area should have access to it, biologists, um, different researchers in the area. And we also realize that we are in the middle of a biosphere that is funded by the Mexican government, but there are other LIDAR surveys that are in areas that are not on government lands. They're not on federal lands. They're in areas where there are lots of private landowners and indigenous communities. And so questions of how, who owns that information is one that archaeologists are struggling with. And it has to be a large three-way conversation between um, stakeholders of various um, backgrounds. So research institutions, government agencies, and local communities. As Kuprat will point out, the logistical challenges to this and many other archaeological imaging projects are considerable. The ethics of LIDAR are justifiably a factor in many important decisions. The internationality of this group's work perhaps heightens that dynamic. As Fernandez Diaz will point out, though, considerable progress has been made in the last dozen years. That's encouraging, he says, both for society and for science. In our case, I think we have been lucky that we have found a dynamic where we can have this huge interinstitutional collaboration and dialogue that is ongoing and, and very fruitful. Uh, but it has its challenges, of course. Imagine with three people coordinating about time change and now <laughs> multiply <me. laughs> that ag <laughs> across continents and institutions. So this is um, something that uh, that has been a challenge, mm -hmm. um, but it's it's definitely it, it has a lot of advantages. I, I want to jump in. Yeah, do so, sorry, and uh, you know, so I. My research center at the University of Houston has been doing uh, archaeological surveys, uh, light archaeological surveys since 2009. I mean, we uh, also, we do research on other, on other fields too, mostly like earth sciences and in the earth sciences, being open, having data that it's open access, it's a little bit easier than like in, in stuff that has some cultural and, and, and uh, natural heritage value, right? But I do say like, you know, since 2009, like we have seen like, uh, like um, improvements in these discussions and some advance, not perhaps not as fast as, you know, I would like to see, but like, you know, uh, I won't say like, Felix said that it was luck that like we were able to do this. No, it has been like actually a lot of hard work with Kathy, uh, other peoples like talking with the authorities in in Mexico. So and of course there's there's the luck comes in the fact that the persons on the other side are willing to participate, right? But it, it has taken like a a huge conscious effort to do a project like this and like you know I mean hopefully it will be. One, that it will be ground, groundbreaking, not only from the archaeological science point of view, but also perhaps on the data sharing and the data management side of things. So it has advanced a lot in, you know, in the last uh, 13 years, but I mean, there's still much more to, to advance. And the cool thing is this. And like, you know, I'm, as an engineer, I see this all the time. I mean, as engineers, we love technology and like we think like our Technology is the coolest thing out there, and um, and we can do great things with it that people in the past could not do. But the thing that we then come and, and face our wall against is what are the social and ethical implications of our technologies, right? Um, and uh, and it's it's been a it's been a hard um, lesson to learn for for an engineer, but it's a very 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 valuable lesson too. I want to just end with this. You know, we talked about this work and what it aims to achieve, and I hope to get your thoughts from all three of you in asking this. And I know we've talked about it a little bit, but you know, what comes next and, and what comes now? You, there's obviously so much more to, to be done in Colic Mool, but you know, if you want to take this on the technology side, feel free. Um, just a forward-looking question uh, to the three of you that I'll pose. What now? Where, where are we going with this work? Well, Juan and I have a pet project that we're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> we want to look at, we want to make LIDAR more affordable, and we want to look at different um, 
different sort of platforms for uh, LIDAR sensing and something that will allow us to get the kind of resolution and accuracy that we get with the Titan with other kinds of sensors, maybe on drones or helicopters, um, in order to make LIDAR accessible for more researchers, not just in archaeology, but in general, because it is so expensive. And so that's a project we've been trying, shopping around, trying to find some some funding for so if you know anyone who wants to fund us out there in your in your blocks i think our listenership might be uniquely qualified to to at least hear that yes we would like we would like to do that we really would we've got a great project that we will we're happy to pitch to anyone um but for me i think it's um Obviously, I've got a lot of work to do at Kalak Mall. I think I will wind up, you know, being in this area for the rest of my career. We would like to do more in the biosphere. We would like to have LIDAR of the, of the entire biosphere. And so we're working on um, expanding our LIDAR area. But, you know, ultimately, I'm an archaeologist. So LIDAR to me is the starting point. And I want to go in and, and learn about the people in this area and learn about the sustainable practices and how um, this incredible uh, civilization arose and and what made it so um, successful over, you know, several thousand years. Um, so that's that's what I am. I'm an archaeologist. Um, so the, I've got questions about people and places and, and human environment interactions that I'm going to be pursuing and hope that our technology advances enough so that I can ask interesting, more and more interesting questions. I know that Juan and Felix have somewhat different perspectives, though. Yeah, may, maybe add to that, that we also want to use those uh, this data and those models that we have obtained now to um, further ad- advance our ability to to present it to the to the general public, to to build some proper platforms um, that people can access that for museography, right? So Kalakmul is an archaeological site that you can visit. Uh, it's very impressive. And um, we're now facing uh, the age where AR and VR are probably going to be much more accessible. It, specifically, AR will be very, very interesting for 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 tours, for on-site engagement with with ancient heritage, and um, this is also a way that we can. Um, minimize the the impact of tourism on the site. So when you can present stuff more in an augmented reality, um, this can be an alternative to excavating, uh, to actually go and cut down all the trees and excavate a structure, right? So if, if you can make a good or uh, an educated guess about how a structure would have looked like, you can include that into the museography at the site. So, so this this kind of, of, of multi multimedia platform development will be interesting and a challenge, I think. Last word to Juan. Well, I think I, I share with Kathy like the desire to one day be able to map a big chunk of the Kalakmu biosphere. So on that on one side, that uh, from as an engineer, I think like we're always looking for making things faster, cheaper, better. Uh, and that that applies not only to the the lidar sensor per se, but also like all the process from collection to the point like you know people like Kathy get their data, and hopefully in the future also like you know that data become like more open access and more open to to, to as many as people possible, while at the same time uh, protecting the, the the cultural and natural resources that it uh, it represents. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthingsphotonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.